Yes, I do. <laughs> so let me start over. Welcome, everybody. This is the Sakai Virtual Conference and the Q&A session on, uh, with the Sakai developers, some of the world's most important Sakai developers. And uh, I'll have the presenters introduce themselves in just a second. But first, some housekeeping. Um, we are using Big Blue Button for this session. Obviously, you know that. You found your way in. Um, I'd suggest that you familiarize yourself with the controls. I've already been chatting with some people who don't have microphones and so forth. If you do have a microphone, you're welcome to use it. Um, and if you'd like to share your webcam, you're welcome to do that too. Brian is uh, graciously allowing us to look into his office. Uh, Matthew is being shy. Earl's being shy. Uh, we'll see if they change their mind about that. Um, if you are speaking, um, I, I'd encourage you to use the headset so that we can minimize the, the echo and uh, mute your audio. But it looks like uh, perhaps... Um, most of you are not going to be using microphones, um, so we'll not worry about that so much. So I'm, for most of you, I think the, the questions are going to be submitted through the chat box, which is to the right of the, the screen here. Um, and just a reminder, this session is being recorded, so you can review it later, uh, which is kind of a cool thing. Um, just a, by way of norms, just a little bit, um, what, what I really hope is that this is a lively and interactive session and that you... Uh, have a chance to ask all your questions. We'll have the presenters introduce themselves in just a minute, um, but I want you to ask questions. And also notice that there is a forum topic for this session if you'd like to use that. Um, you can upload files there, for example, if you have something you want to show um, or a screenshot and that sort of thing. That would be a way that you could do that. Um, so there's lots of ways that we can interact here. But we get to spend the next 45 minutes with some, some really top-notch people. In fact, um, again, I'll, I'll say just a little bit of... Uh, something that by, about these guys. Um, I don't think I'm overstating it if I say that these three are giants in the world of Sakai. Um, I know that my consortium of colleges, we use Sakai extensively, and we owe a great debt to these guys and other people who have done the kind of work they do. We couldn't do what we do if it weren't for people like Earl and Matthew and Brian. Um, so I'm really glad that they're on the call today. Um, Earl and Matthew and Brian um, played the virtual equivalent of rock, paper, scissors, and Earl, they decided that you lost, so you have to go first. Uh, so why don't each one of you just describe, just you know, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you're involved in the in Sakai development, and then uh, we'll just throw it open for questions. So Earl, we'll start with you. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, actually, everybody. <laughs> so so I am the lead software engineer at AsakiNet International, and. Um, it pretty much head up most of um, the Sakai uh, efforts here at Asahi. Um, I've been involved with Sakai since uh, 2006. Um, I recently I've been, you know, the branch manager for Sakai 10, um, you know, and maybe some contributions. Uh, you know, I did, I did a lot of the work around the Sakai configuration, um, fixing Sakai bugs, uh, just, and, and, you know, helping people out um, with whatever Sakai issues they may be having. Um, so, <clears throat> and I think that's good enough. So I'm going to pass it on to Matt. <laughs> Very good. Matthew, you're up next. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Matthew Jones, and I'll pass it on to Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you guys would do something like that. <laughs> Seriously, Matthew, you have to tell just a little bit about what you've done. Come on, man. I I, don't, I didn't really prepare anything. I I don't know. I've been working on Sakai for like six years. I worked at a University of Michigan, and I've worked alongside for about yep. the same amount of time now. And um, yeah, I mostly do a lot of stuff with release. I do a lot of uh, work on maintenance, and uh, like Martin said, I've you know, worked a lot with Martin and uh, people on this uh, this panel. So yeah, very good. All right, Brian. All right, and I'm Brian, and I've been, I've been with Sakai since 2007. Uh, started at IU and moved to Longsite um, four years ago, and just tons of work on Sakai since every you know every year. Just always working on something. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of support, a lot of features, a lot of tools. Um, yep. So we're here to right. answer any questions you guys have. And uh, let me, I, I know, Brian, you were at Indiana University. Matthew was at University of Michigan. Earl, am I right that you were at NYU? Uh, no, I was actually at Marist originally. At Marist, Marist. Sorry, sorry. Okay. okay. Very good. But So we have three different um, academic backgrounds uh, working for at least two different companies and the commercial affiliates of Sakai and 
uh, very central to the to the world of Sakai. So, uh, with that kind of introduction, now we've got a nice uh, lot of people on the calls. Let me again encourage you to type your questions in. It looks like most of you will be typing, but type your questions in to the uh, chat box on the right, which everybody can see. Unlike the GoToMeeting um, session that we have uh, for most of the sessions, this one is big blue button, so everybody can see the questions, which I think is very nice. But I'm going to start out with a, the first one. Uh, Sam Lee Pan had already posted a question in the forum, guys. So uh, here we go. He says, and I quote, uh, this is a very specific question, but previously our institution used to use the Malete tool, which many of you are familiar with. That uh, was d developed by uh, Vivi Sanu and her group. Um, but now we're only supporting the lessons tool. There are still a few sites using Malete. I haven't done any testing directly, but I do believe that Malete only exports to SCORUM or to IMS content packaging, but Lessons only imports from IMS common cartridge files. Do you have any suggestions on how to migrate this file? So very specific question, folks, that requires some Malete experience as well. Who wants to take that one? Ooh. <laughs> We've stumped the panel right out of the chute. <laughs> oh, man. Um. No, we we've done a lot of uh, migrations from Malete to Lessons, but uh, I'm trying to think. There's, I don't think there's a one-to-one -one ratio with that, is there? No, there, there's a patch that I've worked on that I've been kind of um, one of our uh, our long sites clients contributed to starting it, and we put like you know a good amount of hours into it, and then they they said we don't want to finish it, so it's kind of languished out there for a while to support importing uh, content. Uh, CP content packaging into lessons. So I've kind of said, you know, there's been a couple of people that have talked about wanting to have this, you know, in, and it's something that is on my um, medium priority list to get in. So I would, you know, if it, I would say there's a good chance of getting it into 10.3, which is we're expecting to have in the middle of December. But, um, you know, if you want to try it out, if you can test it out, if you have any developers, I think uh, some of it was um, I had it all merged. It, there was just some uh, some issues with some packages, and um, you know, if you have any sample packages, that that's kind of what we, we were we, we kept getting stuck in testing on it. So, so um, I mean, can you point them to the QA server then? The well, there was a Jira. It's not actually in uh, merged in yet. So it was like a lesson builder 331 was the issue. So back when we originally wanted to get it merged, um, Chuck Hedrick didn't want to merge it because he was doing other stuff. And so, but now he said, go ahead and merge it. But since uh, it's since it's a year old, they, they, they're supporting common cartridge 1.3 and maybe 1.4 now. So we have to, um, I had to try to rework the patch and some of the stuff that it had, it wasn't working anymore. And I try to remember what it did. And so it, it basically is, you know, there was a lot of effort in it. And there's, there's still a little bit more effort that it needs to, to finish. I think we had it like kind of maybe... A, a twenty or a forty-hour estimate, and we spent maybe a little more than half of that time on it. So, hmm. so it's kind of like, you know, now. Now it's on us to fit, finish it. You know, as you know, on our time. Yeah. I, I'm I'm curious. I don't know, uh, Sam Lee. What's what institution are you with? UCT. Okay. Um. So that just you know, there there's some thought there. Okay. So we have another question that's come in from Dave Evelyn, who I happen to know. Uh, does anyone have any good examples of how they're building out their lessons, uh, which is more of a pedagogical question? What do they look like, and how do they pair up with the best online teaching practice for online delivery and learning? Uh, what do you What do you technical experts say to that one? That's yeah, beyond my scope. I'm I'm not a teacher or do uh, pedagogy like you're talking about. Um, so I'm no answer. Okay. Earl, you want to take a stab at that one? Uh, that's you know I I also am not a teacher, so um, you know I I think uh, you know I think that's the best question to you know maybe follow up with the teaching and learning group or something like that. That's the best answer I could probably give is just to point to the right people. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, and. Uh, there we go. Okay, we're we're getting some nice chatter going on here, and Karen has uh, provided a, a link to a nice uh, YouTube video, which I have not seen yet. So thanks for that, Karen. That's that's very useful. And Dave, you can follow up on that as well. So um, another question. 
This is this is your chance, folks. You've got uh, <laughs> you've got some serious heavyweights in the room, so you can ask them anything. You could ask them the meaning of life. I'm not sure they'd know that, but you could try. Might be one of those beyond our scope <laughs> that questions. <laughs> I do not recall. Nor do you want to recall. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Here's another one from Dave. Love the use of rubrics in the lessons area, the the peer. But maybe you you guys could talk about the roadmap a little bit with uh, both the rubrics in the the the, the peer assessment that's part of uh, lessons, but also just rubrics in general. I know that's something that my group's been interested in. Okay. Um, a lot of silence, but. So kind of like how there is the content review um, service behind the scenes uh, to integrate rubrics or they're, they're, uh, or content review, I guess that would be like plagiarism. But there is also a new um, thing we've worked on with rubrics, uh, grading service. So it, the groundwork is being laid, um, but I don't think you know anything for Sakai 11 is actually scheduled for rubrics. Yeah, okay. I, haven't, I haven't heard of anybody other than, you know, we had, like Ryan said, um, there was, a, I think Asahi wrote a scoring service that allows easier integration with a iRubric style service. And, um, but all it has is for iRubric, you know, nobody's written a open source or any kind of other alternative as far as I know, other than iRubric, so. Yeah, that's correct, Matt. We, you know, nothing's, nothing else has been done. It's just, just that simple scoring service. So. We, we could, you know, someone could do that. I think it was one of the options for you could vote on for, for some of the funding from this conference was, you know, either making a iRubric service like that, either integrated or otherwise, or, um, but it, it hasn't materialized. Um, yeah, let me let me just interject here. First of all, sorry, I apparently went dead for a second. I talked a lot, Brian, but apparently it was to the ether. So, <laughs> um, and you went ahead without me, which I appreciate very much. Oh, sorry. No, no, it's good. I'm glad you filled in the gap because um, I realized I was frozen and you were frozen. And then you, I, the le next thing I heard was you saying, oh, dead silence. I'm going, I've been talking. Okay. <laughs> so, um, but let's go back to the rubrics thing. Uh, first of all, Earl, a question for you. Asahi has been working on this. Could you describe that interface a little bit? And I guess a, a second question is, is it part of what's publicly available or is it an Asahi specific thing? Uh, so, so the work was actually um, included in the Edu Services package um, that's in the Sakai trunk right now. Um, again, we don't. I don't know that it's slated, um, you know, particularly, it, you know, for any particular version at this point. But um, you know, it just it you know it's it's for integration with the rubrics. So you know, again, there's not much that's uh, kind of used it at this point so you know there's really not much to to begin to talk about mm -hmm. um may, this might be helpful to give a little context to the, the rest of the folks our consortium the lamp consortium used irubric uh, which is a, a commercially available service um, available from a company called reason systems r-e-a-z-o-n um, and we liked it quite well but its interface to sakai was shall we say difficult and when Sakai 2.9 came along, we actually had to discontinue it because the, the interface didn't work anymore. Now we understand, and, and I'm learning something here, Earl, that perhaps Asahi has been part of this, um, that there are some, there's some hope on the horizon that perhaps it will interface better um, in the future. And there was a tool that we liked very much, although it, you know, it was an additional expense to, to integrate it. Um, but then there was then now a second thought. Um, is that there is uh, some move towards rubrics in the lessons area, the peer rubrics, as Dave has mentioned. And Brian and Matthew, you guys were working on that some. So could you talk a little bit about the roadmap of those tools? Do, are, are you aware of any? Is there any thought about where those that's going? Uh, actually, I didn't work on that. And I would just assume that was uh, Chuck that did that work. Ah, okay. I, I didn't. It's, it's pretty simple. I mean, it's it's one of the you know, the feedback I get from when I hear about it, and it's only for um, students, uh, student pages. 
So it's not, you know, it's not built into lessons itself. It's really just in the subset of the student pages. Uh, and I think there's been a lot of good feedback from it. And I think people are going to use that as the, uh, as the design for, you know, future uh, modifications. But mm -hmm. I mean, I don't really know any uh, lesson plan or any uh, roadmap for the lessons review. Okay. Fair enough. Um, let me ask this question. Um, not well. I'll ask a question first. There's a lot of people on this call. Um, how many of you are finding a, a desire for rubrics integrated into Sakai in some way or another? Could you just give me a quick, you know, yes or I am or our school is, you know, use the hand raise. That would be fine. Yep, we can do that too. Um, there's a hand raise tool. I don't know if you guys have access to it because I'm not sure. It looks like they've kind of limited non-presenters <laughs> what you can do. <laughs> um, but uh, are, are you are you looking for rubrics? Yeah, so Sam Lee says rubrics would be nice. That's what I'm looking for. Is just you know what kind of interest there is from folks who are out there about the the rubrics tool. Uh, speaking for my consortium, this is a this is an area of of great interest uh, among us. We'd really like to get something like that. Okay, so I'm getting some yeses coming in here. That's great. Thanks. Um, so let me explain this, that one of the cool things that Wilma worked out about this conference is that your registration fee uh, would go towards the development of some project within Sakai, uh, the decision about which to be devoted upon by the people who attend the conference. So one of the choices has to do with rubrics. And if you're interested in that as having some development money, you know, your, your registration fee and others going towards that, you should vote on that. Um, it would be something that you could do. There are other very, very worthwhile projects as well. Um, I'm not to say that that's the only one. Um, but that's that's a really neat feature of this conference is that you're actually voting on how some of uh, the funds will go towards upgrading Sakai in some way that you care about. So very good. Um, let's go on to another question. I had a faculty member raise the question of being able to auto enter zero once a test or quiz passes its due date for an assessment that only have specific answers. Uh, presently, the faculty member has to manually enter a zero for each student's quiz or use the enter zero for every blank entry. Is there a better or more efficient way? Um, and I, I know a little bit about the context of this one. Um, uh, oh, OK, I'll t come to that in just a second here. It's not a, it's not a, um, I, I know a little bit more about this particular question. The, the professor basically has a quiz uh, that he gives prior to the students coming to class. The quiz ends immediately upon class beginning. If you have not taken the quiz at that point, um, you don't get a chance to. And what he'd like to be able to do is just for that quiz be able to say anybody who has a blank gets a zero, uh, but not do that for all assignments uh, and all, or, or sorry, all quizzes. So any thoughts about that, guys? Anybody who's familiar, who's the most familiar with Samago of the, of the gang here? <laughs> um, so I worked on a... Um a Jira, I thought it was for two nine, but it was the apply score to all un uh, ungraded tests. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I mean, is that not what what you would want uh, for this situation? Essentially, you go to the the scoring page, and there's a field on the top that we can enter a number. Uh, in this case, you'd want a zero, right. and you click the button that says apply to all ungraded um, tests. You know, anybody that has a blank or ungraded would get the zero for that test. And it, for that one it sounds test, like that's what you need. It's exactly what we need. Is that in trunk yet, it Brian? Is. I think Matt just showed it. It's Sam yeah. 904. 904. Um, so that should be there, especially for Dave. Um, okay. Yeah, so it's there. Maybe they just didn't know it was there. Or if yeah, they Looks like there's just a box, and you just put in a score to apply everybody with no submission. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do it automatically, but you have to go in and, and put in the number. Yeah, it's not automatic. Um, so that, that would be the that's, that's yeah, that'd be that's, additional. That's the mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm just realizing that I'm missing. I'm I'm falling behind here. Um, Let's see. Sam Lee, you asked a question uh, that maybe I missed a piece of it. It, it. it just lost after the quote. Perhaps it's not a technical phase yet, uh, but would there be space to add a quote? And that's where it's, and then it says almost like a trigger is all I've got. 
Um, oh, I think it's just I think at the he just finished the question. Oh, okay, I see it. Premature. There, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right, you want to take that one, guys? Add a progress bar to show how far students are finishing learning objects, assignments, tests, etc. Ooh, that's a tough one. That's interesting. Let's see. I mean, you know, that's not obviously not available in Sakai, uh, but you know, Lessons has the uh, outcomes ability where you can, you know, unlock certain things based on a an assignment score, your um, feedback, and stuff like that in forums. So. I mean, maybe you can, you know, do some kind of gamification style with lessons. Uh, I know Wilma uh, definitely worked a lot on that. So if you, had, you know, any, if, she, if there's anybody to, uh, you know, get suggestions from, it'd be just Wilma at longsite.com. Um, so I can type that in. That should. Yeah, I would you that. got that? Yep. You go ahead. And should she's uh, done some work with like. Uh, not not just gaming, but like uh, badging and stuff like that. So um, I'd contact her if, and she'd have any ideas how you could use lessons outcomes for a uh, progress style. Yeah, that's a good one. I've I've found Willem to be very very sharp about this kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. okay, another question. Y'all are being very quiet. I usually run a, a web conference with folks. Uh, uh, once a month, and I can't keep them quiet, and you all are I'm not used to this. <laughs> oh, there you go. Uploading from iPads for assignments. Sure, that's a hard one. <laughs> and, and not really under you guys' control. Anybody have an answer on that one? I don't, I don't know any progress on it. I'm assuming, um, you know, the big issue with iPads is you don't really have a file system, right? So it requires some kind of like a app, I guess, to be developed that can handle uh, basically the files on on the on the iPad. Yeah. Well, it's uh, Dave raised the issue of of Google integration. You want to talk a little bit about thoughts about that? Um. I don't know. I know University of Michigan is probably the most developed with their Google integration. Well, yeah, you know, I saw he had a had a, the Docs thing, and Google, uh, University of Michigan, I think, has a bunch of Google integrations. I don't know specifically what they are. Sounds like Earl should talk about <clears throat> that. Yeah, I mean, so you know, so you know, um, I think the original developer on that Google Doc stuff was Duffy Gilman from way back. Um, when we were part of our smart and um, you know, then I think what, what recently has happened is, you know, Google deprecated their 1.0 authentication, OAuth authentication. So um, I think everybody has to move by next year sometime. So what we did was we updated the integration to work with their OAuth 2. And um, um, <clears throat> yeah, that's correct, Martin. Um, so um, we uh, uh, upgraded the authentication to use OAuth 2, basically, so that people, if they wanted to continue using the uh, the Google integration that was in uh, resources, they could continue to do that. Um, though, though I will say, um, I do like the idea, the strategy that Michigan took with uh, the integration there. Uh, I think that's, you know, uh, making it LTI based like that seems like a good fit because, you know, now you're not constrained to, um, just doing it the way resources does it, right? Um, there's, there's like pros and cons, you know, for, for doing that kind of integration. But I do believe like, uh, the LTI integration that, um, that Michigan, uh, is, is doing probably allows for more leeway to do more things. And any, any, do you have any knowledge, Earl, about where that is in terms of sort of the rest of the world? Um, is that a, a Michigan specific thing that'll find its way back in trunk at some point, do you think? Or where do you think that stands? Uh, from what I, I mean, some others can comment, especially Matt. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's kind of got some ties there to Michigan. Uh, but the lay, the last I heard from, I think from Beth was they're looking to eventually open source it, I think. Okay, that would be cool. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> Dave, you're asking lots of questions. <laughs> like I said, Matt might know more than I would about that. Yeah, I haven't I haven't heard anything since the uh, thir- to 13 conference uh, last year in um, San Diego. So I, I I haven't talked to anybody there that uh, specifically about this uh, project they're working on. Okay, but still good to know about. Yeah, I think the code is out there and contrib, and you know they're still um, they're still working on stuff like this. But uh, I don't know how to run it or anything. They have a lot of calendar and drive. They have like they calendar and drive code, but uh, I've never specifically tried to run it. Yeah, and okay. I say the same here. I haven't yeah. specifically run that. But there's some some movement in that direction, which is encouraging. Okay. Cool. Um, can somebody talk about search within a course? You know, maybe let's start with uh, sort of how it how you envision it being used and you know, better ways to leverage it. So I I assume we're talking about um, you know the the search tool that's that's in that's that's in Sakai that's currently in there. Uh, you know, right. most people probably know that, you know, that you can use two different, there's like two different search implementations you can use. There's one from Solar. I believe that, um, the guys from UK, um, from Oxford, um, kind of, uh, they've kind of, uh, you know, championed, uh, the Solar implementation. And then, um, there was Asahi championed the Elasticsearch piece of that. Um, Elasticsearch is pro, is the default that's in Sakai 10 when you set it up. Um, mostly because I, I believe most of that was just around because Elasticsearch could be embedded and solar, although maybe it could be embedded, but I think it was like more heavier weight. Um, um, so, uh, you know, Elasticsearch seemed like a better, a better choice, um, for, you know, for the default out of the box choice. Um, you know, there, there is some great things uh, that can be done with search, obviously. Um, for example, uh, you know, right now, you know, there's um, uh, there's not there's not as much. We would like to have more features. Um, like, for example, there's uh, you can say, um, you know, restrict this search to like a specific site or, you know, there can be tags that are, um, you know, that are added uh, that, you um, you know, that, that can help, you know, uh, filter your searches and things like that. Um, uh, there's, uh, um, you know, the searching, I think overall is, is much better than what it used to be in Sakai. I think, uh, everybody will attest to that. Um, I think that Elasticsearch has been great. Um, there were a few hiccups, I believe in 10.1 with it and they were fixed in 10.2. Um, um, and most of that, most of that was, was dealing with when you were in a clustered Sakai environment. So, um, in Sakai 10.2, we kind of fixed those up and, and, uh, so now that the, now, you know, clustering, um, in 10.2, uh, with Elasticsearch works very well. Um, I don't know what anybody else really wants to know about it. So I'll, uh, maybe pass it on to one of the other panelists, see if they want to. Add anything? I mean, search has definitely been improved for Sakai 10 compared to the previous versions. So definitely reevaluate it. Yeah, there you go. That's maybe good advice. Take another look at it. Okay, we've got another question come in here, guys. Um, it's interesting. It's not showing up in my box, but when I copy all and paste it into a word processor, I see it. So just in case you don't see it, um, I'm sorry if I mispronounced this, Kurosh says, with tools deploying some parts into Tomcat's shared area, is there some support for cross-service transactions through Magic or Spring or something? For example, if I want to change the title of an academic session, I would have to use A, the course management API to change the title, and then B, the site service to iterate over and update all course sites referencing it. Is there some API support to do all those calls in a transaction in case something blows up halfway through? Now, that's a fairly technical question. So, you know, I can, I mean, I've, I think anybody that's used Sakai at one point, you know, when they start out with like a pilot and, 
they start out calling terms one thing and then later on when they integrate with their SIS, you know, terms are called something else, right? And, right. you know, and then people have to like straighten that stuff out. Um, most of the time, I think that um, you can straighten that out with a few database calls, um, um, just, you know, updating, um, um, with you know, just a few SQL scripts um, and it cleans the, most of it up. I don't, I don't know that, um, you know, typically once people get it straightened out, you know, it's fine then, you know, going forward. So. So you're saying there may be an acute need for it at, at some point, but often that need sort of goes away once it's resolved. It's sort of one and done kind of thing. Exactly. And it's, and it's, you know, running some SQL is kind of trivial. So, you know, to just run some SQL to fix up those names. So mm -hmm. typically I think that's, you know, Correct. that's how it's for, approached. Yeah, for things like names, definitely SQL. Um, if you're going to be doing stuff like adding sites and updating sites, and, you know, there's, um, well, they do web services. I think right now, you know, the recommendations for RESTful web services, but I'm not really sure how verbose they are compared to the um, SOAP services, because that's usually, you know, what we do to create batch modifications to, um, you know, just... That's the best way to do it. Just write yourself a uh, soap. Uh, on, and, you know, I keep on suggesting soap. I mean, but it just seems easier um, for now, even though it's going to be deprecated for 11. Um, but it's just easy. You write the Java code basically as if you would in a tool in Sakai. And so you could write, like you said, um, like the uh, site service and iterate through the, um, you know, through all the sites and update them that way. And then you just use the site service to save the site. So that's, that's what I'd recommend for any, you know, logically intensive modifications. And then it's essentially you just write your own Java code. Okay. And you can see the Karash is, is following up. The academic session thing is just an example. The main question is if there's transaction support across API services. And, and Ryan, that, that was news to me that SOAP's being deprecated. So maybe we need to talk a little bit more about transaction support in general. So, okay. I, I don't really have an answer for the transaction support across API services. Um, yeah, I mean, across, um, you know, since, I mean, I think we were originally talking about what web services for that stuff and the web services call the APIs and, you know, depending on the, you know, the AP, the API call, I mean, you know, most Sakai stuff is, you know, everything's wrapped in a transaction. So, but if you're trying to say, well, I want to, you know, update multiple things, um, you know, that potentially would be multiple, let's say web service calls or, multiple API calls within a web service. Um, you know, those, those are typically not transactioned, you know, they're not, you know, each one is wrapped in its own. So, so I don't think you have it at that level if that's what you're looking for. Yeah. Um, basically like the a hundred percent guarantee transaction style. So definitely not. Okay. Um, but going on to the soap issue. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, um, SOAP is not deprecated in 11. Um, what no. is deprecated is the Axes implementation of SOAP. Um, yeah, what we true. did was, is there was uh, a new, um, we used a new framework uh, instead of Axes called CXF, um, which um, um, is now providing um, the SOAP, uh, uh, SOAP endpoints uh, for Sakai Web Services. Um, so what's, what's going away in 11 is the axes implementation of SOAP. So you'll still be able to use SOAP using CXF, like I said, and, um, you'll just, there's a new, uh, a new URL for it. I'll, uh, paste it there in the thing. Um, and, uh, um, which the one nice thing to point out about that is, um, that the new stuff, the new, uh, the new CXF stuff does SOAP and RESTful um, services, uh, which is kind of nice. So uh, you can got, you can kind of get to it uh, <clears throat> using uh, using that link. If you open that up uh, or click on that, you'll see that these are the new 
uh, soap services. The, the actual soap services aren't new. They're just uh, the CXF version of them is new. Um, you'll notice that there's basically 90, I would say 95% of all the web services that were in the axes are in the, are in the, uh, the CXF version. Um, there was, you know, you know, like I said, 95% of them weren't changed, but there were a few that need to be changed. I think it was mostly around like if, um, Axis allowed you to do method overriding and in CXF, they don't typically allow that. So you had to create a new method for that. So, uh, so there was a few that change. Um, but if you go all the way down to the bottom, you'll see the restful endpoints of those same, uh, of those, uh, same soap web services. So what was really kind of cool was all of a sudden now you got, you know, a, uh, all your soap services, uh, traditional soap services now all got a restful, um, endpoint as well for, uh, so that you can use them. So that was a nice game. So not a step backwards, actually a step forward. Yeah, exactly. A step forward. And, um, you know, I mean, Axes was one of the things I think that we all noticed was, is that Axes is leaking, was always leaking memory because, it the so there was one nice thing about axes right you could drop a jws file in there and it was like dynamic like it was like automatic it would compile at that time and you could make changes to it and it was easy to do so the dra the downside to cxf is that you know obviously you you can't do that no more you you have to make the change in the code and you have to redeploy um you know so there's one that's one downside but um the, the one nice side is, is that you're not reloading classes all the time, which is, I think, where the memory leak was in axes. And some Sakai systems would notice that they would have a lot of, um, a lot of these, uh, uh, classes, like they would have to restart Sakai or something because, um, uh, axes wasn't unloading the classes correctly mm -hmm. when it would recompile them. So. Hmm. Okay. Um, let's switch gears and talk about CSS a little bit. There's been a question that came in a few minutes ago from Rob Keeney. Um, is there a way to make a default CSS file work across projects and courses? Also, is there a way to hide it from the resources? Um, and I'll add to that, I have a question. This has been a little bit of a thorn in my side. Is there any way to apply different CSSs to the My Workspace area in particular? I know that's a specific question for us because we have particular needs. But can we talk a little bit about CSS? All right. Uh, I mean, I have an answer for Martin's yeah. question. I was, I was waiting for see if someone had a quick answer for Rob's. Um, but for Martin's, I'll just go ahead and let let Matt and Earl think about the other one. Um, I mean, it's there is a way to do it to make multiple uh, uh, skins for you know different kinds of users, but. It's definitely a headache. Um, you have to have a user type, and then from that user type, you know. So in your case, Martin, you're you're talking yeah. about multiple institutions. Yeah. So the user type would be, you know, student dash the institution name or something. Yeah. You'd have to have separate. Right. Uh, it's you, there's a lot of realm work to do to make that ready to work. And then from there, you can create a template for the each my workspace um, for yeah. that user type, and that template would have your skin as the default. You can set that. Okay, I I understand what you're talking about. Yeah, that's. It's, not, it's the question is is it worth the work? Worth the work? Because <laughs> it would be yeah, a lot. That's of work. the hard part. You gotta yeah. you gotta set it all up and send that information over for the user. Yeah, right. um, okay. So is, question. Trying to pull it back up. Is there a way to make a default CSS file work? I, I guess I don't follow the question too well. Yeah. More about that. Would really, you like me to, would you like me to explain? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, you can upload a default.css file in a course or project, uh, which makes it work within that project itself. But then um, two problems. Number one, it shows up in the resources area. And if you try to hide that resource, then it doesn't work for students. If you unhide it, then they get to see it or do whatever okay. they want to with it. The second issue, and that's, that's just an annoyance. The second qu bigger question is I'd like that default CSS file to work across all of my sites. Now, I know that's kind of a lamp thing because um, 
you know, you obviously wouldn't want that to apply to the entire LAMP school's instance, but just Frosty Acres. But I have I mean, to manually up. I have to manually upload that to each course or project. What What I'd recommend in that case, if you if you have a skin that you keep on reusing, I would just add it to the skins list. Um, and so that would require, you know, um, your your hosting service. Um, I'm assuming your lamp, I guess. Correct. Um, so it'd require us to basically deploy it to Sakai, and then we can add it to the list. If you go to your site and go to edit or site info and yeah. you go to edit information. Okay. Um, you can then select that skin. Um, and so you'd have to do that every time you, you know, you have a new site, you just select that skin. So how um, do I get, so how do I get that CSS information into the skin itself? Is that something that I can do or is that? No teacher, teachers cannot do that. It requires some kind of administrator. Um, yep. so I am the, I'm the god of everything here, so. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a tool out there called Skin Manager that, um, obviously like, like Brian was saying that, um, you know, only admins usually typically have access to that tool, but, um, typically, you know, the, uh, you know, admins, you know, would use the Skin Manager tool to, you know, download their skin, make changes to it and upload it. So. Yeah, and then I, you can get it to show up on your site list. Okay, good. Um, folks, we're getting close to the end here, so let me let me tackle this last batch of questions that have come in around uh, the idea of Morpheus and so forth. Um, Adam asked a question um, about the lesson builder lesson lesson builder tool initiatives. You all want to take take that one? Has to do with iframes on mobile. Okay. Um, iframes are going away. So if you go to Sakai's trunk QA, you'd actually see that there are no more iframes in Sakai. Um, and that's going to be, that's a project that's going to, you know, it's easy to, not easy, I guess. I'm not going to, you know, minimize it, but it, you know, it's been done, but the hard part is now you have to test everything to make sure still, things still work without iframes. So there's definitely going to be a lot of work with that. What do we the replace iframe. the iframe with? Um, essentially, it's it's just kind of a, like a dynamic loading. Um, so the portal loads the portal, and then from there it kind of uh, it's, it loads. It finds the uh, um, uh, the tool basically that it needs to load, and just kind of loads it into the HTML for that portal. So if you're familiar with like uh like Sakai OAE works, I mean that's kind of the same idea where it just kind of piecemeal starts loading itself. Um so that's the idea. So it's really all just one big template, but the way the portal just kind of handles the way that it loads it. Yeah, I mean there's there is like a uh you know, like a tool container, um, you know, just a div or whatever or something yeah. like that. That where the tool actually loads into that you know, the portal calls out to and says, you know, tool and the tool gets loaded into there. So, yeah, the layout's exactly the same, except for in, instead of iframe, it's just a div. Yeah. Hmm. We're, yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's, you know, the, I, I mean, uh, the main, uh, people that are working and, you know, there's a lot of sessions like, you know, at this, at the virtual conference here. And stuff are, you know, Chuck, um, Severance has been working on the removing. Chuck Severance is kind of like the maintainer of the portal code. So, and he's been kind of, uh, you know, he's done most of the work to remove the iframes, um, from the portal. Um, and, uh, and then there's, um, uh, Mark Riley, obviously, who's been doing all the, um, CSS and you know, work for Morpheus and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it's important to have these iframes removed i think there are like challenges with doing that because like when you have two tools that display on a page you know you know how how you can kind of do that um it gets very tricky um when you when you do that and i think actually right now is if you do uh, uh, decide to deploy on a on a single page two tools um i think they have to uh, render an iframe um for each of those tools because uh, just, uh there's um, you know, so there's, there's some challenges with it. Um, and I think, I know somebody made a mention to lessons, uh, to lesson builder. Um, I think, um, that 
I think that's a bigger issue. I don't think it's like specifically a lessons issue. I think it's a, a RSF issue. Um, that they need to work out yet. Um, it's gonna, it'll happen. Just, just kind of needs to happen. Um, uh, but yeah, the, the the two main people are Chuck Severins and and uh, uh, and Mark Riley are the are the, the two that are heading it up. So. Well, guys, we're uh, we're we're to the end of our 45-minute session. We need the people to have time to move from class to class. Uh, so, um, but I really appreciate everybody being here. I mean, this is a nice, nice big crowd. I'm impressed. I should suddenly I suddenly realized I should take a screenshot so I know who who actually came um, because there's not a tool for doing that in Big Blue Button. Uh, but I have put the link in the chat there for where you can go. Uh, to continue the discussion, there's a there's a forum set up, so a threaded discussion that you know can continue this conversation if it needs to. Uh, so please feel free to use that. And uh, with that, guys, I see Matthew's getting his last words in here. <laughs> um, thanks for that. Uh, but guys, I really appreciate it. You you've done a good job of fielding a very wide variety of questions, and thanks to the audience for asking good questions. And uh, with that, I'll let you go and move on to your next se session. But uh, thanks for being a part of the Sakai Virtual Conference. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. You are currently the only person in this conference.